Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of the Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernard Beitman, MD. Please remember, meaningful coincidences illuminate the invisible, the invisible currents that connect and unify us. Please like and subscribe to us by pushing the buttons below. Now, coincidence stories are best told if there is a title to the story, and then at the end, your meaning is described. So here goes one that happened this morning. The title of this is The Spiral Shows the Way. Last night, I went to bed wondering whom to ask to write the foreword to my new book, Meaningful Coincidences. It's coming out in September. Many names popped up. How about the psychologist who knows fractals so well came the question. After all, the sky on the cover of my new book is dominated by the golden spiral, which is derived from fractals based on the Fibonacci sequence. Spirals, Fibonacci sequence. Oh, after a few yeses and nos and maybes this morning, I picked up my novel to do my usual morning reading. And this one's called The Magician's Land. In it, where I was reading this morning, a botanist is looking at a weird plant on a very old document page. He says, the, the botanist says, the leaf arrangement looks chaotic, but it isn't. It follows a mathematical sequence, usually the Fibonacci or Lucas. Uh, uh, there it was, the Fibonacci. I've been just thinking Fibonacci. Spirals. Well, so this magical book confirmed that I should consider asking Terry Marks Tarlow to write the foreword to Meaningful Coincidences. She knows a lot about fractals. And fractals appear to be uh, meta patterns by which good parts of the universe are constructed because the universe seems to like to repeat patterns as people do as well. So the meaning, the meaning to me of this was, this is not the first time this, this book and other books, but this one in particular have mirrored what is going on in my life. Curious how that works. Reality regularly, regularly mirrors our minds. Regularly mirrors our minds. How's that work? Mind mirrors out there. Well, I think we may get into that some with our guest today, who is Ray Grassi, who has authored seven books, including The Waking Dream, An Infinity of Gods, Signs of the Times, and The Sky Stretched Out Before Me. And to me, the sky stretched out once to infinity. He worked on the editorial staff of the Theosophical Society from 1989 to 1999 and has been associate editor of the Mountain Astrologer magazine for over 20 years. He has studied with teachers in both Kriya Yoga and Zen traditions. And he comes to us from the grand city of Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to the show, Ray. Nice to be here. You know, I want to, I didn't know you were going to say that beforehand about the fractal notion. And as we were talking, uh, I'm working on uh, finishing up my eighth book right now uh, called When, uh, when the Stars Align. And on the cover of the book, I have a fractal image. And as we were talking, I just got an email from my graphic designer about the placement of the uh, fractal image on the cover of the book as you were talking about fractals. And fractals are a really profound 
esoteric idea in terms of as above, so below that notion of levels and octaves of meaning going from smaller to higher and vice versa. Oh, what, why don't you elaborate on that one a little bit, the octaves of, octaves of meaning. And before that, I, I like, I mean, I enjoy that you were just do it fractalizing about your own book uh, and what to do with fractals on your cover. I mean, that's a pretty good synchronicity between you and me. Uh, where where we're mirror where you're mirroring me and I'm mirroring you, um, and that illustrates what I was trying to be able to say. Uh, and what do you think about that? And then we go to the octaves. Well, um, you know the whole notion of synchronicity, and this is part of what we're going to be talking about. Excuse me, is my idea anyway? My belief that the notion of synchronicity excuse me, goes back into ancient times, that the idea that there are meaningful events is as old as humanity. And synchronicities are one aspect of that belief. And if you go back into whether it's the Babylonian Omen series or the Native American tradition or even the Christian tradition, you find this notion in the Bible, you know, when Jesus died, there was an eclipse or uh, the wise men saw a star in the sky, and that was an omen that talked about the birth of Jesus. There are many different kinds of meaningful events, and this has come down to us in some way through science with certain concepts, like the fractal is a very, it's kind of a reductionistic view of it, but it's this idea that, that you have, uh, as above, so below, you might say, you take a fractal pattern and it repeats across multiple levels. And that happens in our life in terms of a certain symbolic pattern will happen in childhood, it'll happen again in adulthood, you might have something happen uh, on the earth and then it might be reflected in the stars of so this multiple levels, octaves and that sort of thing. So fractals gives us kind of a modern way to think of it, even though it's not exactly the same, it's close enough that, that we can use it as a way to vector into that ancient uh, mindset. Does that does that make oh, sense? Yeah, yeah, it really does. And and just where fractals are separate from that ancient mindset, uh, we don't have to try to separate. But what I began to think of, even though it's a, it's it's kind of the kind of, it's fractals have a beginning sense of linearity to them. I mean, they, there's a crystallizing form of fractals, but there are many different kinds of fractals. The ones that I know that most people know are the branching version, uh, the branching version of uh, dendrites of a neuron and the branches of a tree uh, are examples of how uh, that pattern is repeated and in the stars as well. So, but there are more, there are different kinds of fractal patterns. And I like the idea of meta patterns, patterns of patterns. And I think you do too, from what you're telling me, but the, the way ancients thought about it and the way uh, fractals are, there's a little bit of a disconnect for you in, in thinking of them to, as together. Could you tell us what that is? Well, fractals are one aspect of, of uh, the symbolist, I call it symbolist. I got that term from uh, Schwaller de Lubitsch and John Anthony West, this idea of a symbolic outlook on life. And I think fractals touch on one aspect of it. It's not the entire kit and caboodle, but it's, it's an important aspect of it. Um, for example, I mean, the notion of the microcosm is a very uh, standard idea in a traditional symbolist thinking. And fractals touch on, touches on that, the notion of fractals. Um, the notion that one thing can embody the whole, like. A, yeah, the palm, for example, in palmistry, the, the way that palmistry works is it's the notion that the patterns in the hand reflect your whole life, reflect your whole body. Uh, iridology gets into the idea that the eyes reflect the whole person in some sense. The part reflects the whole. Yeah. And that does tie into fractals very closely. Uh, but symbolist thinking extends in many different directions. Like you were saying, there are different kinds of fractals. There are different kinds of symbolist principles. There's not just that notion of as above, so below. There's, I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds here with some of the other things, because fractals is one of the easier things to talk about. Uh, but like, like I said, the microcosm. Astrology is based on the notion of the microcosm. 
the notion that the individual life reflects the cosmos. And that if you look to the patterns of the cosmos through the moments uh, of, the, of birth and where the stars and the planets are at the moment you're born, that somehow tells you it's a cipher into who you are and what your life is going to be about. Um, I guess I learned that uh, that in every grain of sand uh, is a universe. Yeah, yeah, the, the Blake uh, idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it, it, the, one of the practical ways of thinking about that. Let me and let me see what you think of it. Is is intuition that uh, having a, a little bit of a sense of something kind of like pops up in your mind to say something it's almost like this morning when i said okay i i had this this fractal connection um so i'm going to bring it up it's a little bit of uh yeah this feels right to do it but look what happened with it uh you were at the same time i'm talking about it you're talking about fractals and your book and your book cover um how how do you think about how that works what part of that? I'm not sure I know so, the question. That, that what you were doing, what I was doing is what you were doing. I think that it's all, and this is a cliche, but it happens to be true, I think. Everything is interconnected, and everything is connected in a certain moment in time. And so the fact that we're having this talk right now, uh, you know, there's a certain convergence of energies that are happening in your life and my life. Otherwise, we wouldn't be connecting right now. So there's going to be some intersections, some visible, some invisible between what you're doing and what I'm doing. And it's, it's, it's interesting to me, that whole fractal thing, the fact that you were going to talk about that. And I had no idea that you know, I hear fractals have been on my mind for the last 24 hours, because I'm thinking so much about the cover of this book. And then you bring up fractals. I think that's fascinating. Well, I'll add to that, Ray, that um, sometimes I get kind of anxious when I'm talking to people on this in this way. I mean, we've met before um, a long time ago, uh, but there was something about my feeling really comfortable talking with you today that it just, I didn't have a need to like worry about just what am I going to talk about? What are we going to do? Um, it seemed like it was going to be easy. Uh, and that coincidence at the beginning was just a, another, to me, an indicator of like, uh, we have a, a connection uh, that it was confirmed that I feel good with you. And that confirmed it. Uh, and that's pretty cool. Well, let me take this in a little bit different direction, because I still want to answer your question before, which I really didn't uh, answer too well about. Um, well, let me give the example. There was a woman that I uh, worked with at the Theosophical Society named Maggie. And we worked in the same office uh, where I was an editor. And uh, an older woman, and she was a very sweet person, and uh, she got a stroke and she was bedridden for a number of months. And then uh, towards the end, she went into hospice and I went to visit her and um, it was getting towards the end. And I thought, boy, it's not gonna be long before she moves on. And I was riding my bike through a local forest preserve. Uh, I live on the Western suburbs out here outside of Chicago, about 30 miles west. And I was riding my bike through a local forest area and I went across a bridge across a river. And as I'm going across the bridge, I see a deer swimming across the river right near the bridge. Now, I've, I've seen deer many times in the woods. I've never seen one swimming in the river. And that was, so there was an element of unusualness to it. It was an anomaly for me, not in terms of nature, but in terms of my own life. I'd never seen a deer swimming before. And I thought, okay, now what's the symbolism there? Uh, crossing the river, that's an age old metaphor for like crossing the River Jordan or the River Styx or whatever it is. And I thought, boy, I have the feeling, I wonder if I'm going to hear about Maggie passing. And I got home from my bike ride and there was a, a voicemail saying that Maggie passed right at the time that I saw that deer crossing the river. Now that doesn't tie in quite so much to the fractal, fract, fractal idea, but it's still, there was a coincidence of events. It was a symbol. It wasn't that you know, people try to understand how astrology works in terms of energies from the planets and the stars, but I don't see it that way. I see it as symbols. And so when I saw that deer, it wasn't that there was some force field from that deer affecting me. It wasn't as though it had some kind of uh, 
quantum physical uh, effect. It's that there was uh, these things happen, like we're talking about fractals, we're talking about uh, synchronicity. These things come together in a symbolic way. It's uh, the deer was a, uh, it was in my consciousness at that moment in relation to Maggie passing. And, you know, there's, it's a whole different mindset. It's a whole different worldview than trying to understand things in a purely materialistic, reductionistic, uh, quantum physical even way. Does, does that communicate what I'm trying to say? Definitely. Uh, it correlates with uh, an increasing belief that that we live in an information universe, that it's all information running around out there. I would, I would modify that a little bit. I, I, this came up in an interview that I did a few months ago. I would say meaning. There is a difference between information and meaning. So when I hear scientists talk about an information universe, that can be understood scientifically. That can be understood in terms of bits of ones and zeros and all that. But we're talking about meaning. It's kind of like you can break down Moby Dick, Melville's Moby Dick in terms of information. You can break it down into quantum bits and all this. But how do you understand the meaning of Moby Dick? That takes a hermeneutic mindset. And so I, 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 don't, I, I don't totally mind the notion of information. But to me, meaning is a is a deeper sort of way of understanding these things. We live in a meaningful universe. It's one step beyond information, if I can put it yeah. that way. It's a, it's making sense out of information uh, is yeah. the way I would. That's a good way it. to put it. Uh, Very and, good way. And who, hey, who do we got around here ready to make sense out of information? Uh, you got any, you know anybody? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it seems to be us chickens running around out here yeah. are the meaning makers. Yeah. When I talk about um, causation or explanation for synchronicity, for meaningful coincidences, uh, pe people, oh, quantum physics, quantum field theories, and all, a lot of other ideas, I say it's the human predisposition to see patterns. Yeah. If you don't if you don't predispose to see patterns, and by patterns, I imply meaning, because a pattern has, uh, we're going to get to what meaning is, I hope, but not too far into that one. Yeah. Because uh, patterns is a little easier for me. The meaning is not. Uh, but if, if you don't have a predisposition to see the pattern, as you did crossing the river and seeing the deer and noticing an anomaly of a deer swimming across the river and you say ah an anomalous event well i've been just thinking about maggie too do those things two things correlate anomalous here passing there crossing passing patterns and that that's the meaning that ray grassy got from this that this was about passing and you could like wonder whether that was a comment on Maggie, which it was. Yeah. And, you know, one of the principles in uh, traditional thinking is anomalies and yes. the notion of how do you tell what event is meaningful and which isn't. And one of the traditional guidelines is how unusual is it? Uh, what is the anomalous you know, nature of it? So for instance, if you, an example I use in The Waking Dream is uh, if you have the newspaper delivered to your front doorstep every day, that doesn't mean anything if you get the newspaper and you see it has a headline about something. But let's say you've never had a newspaper subscription in your whole life. If I, I, I'm not even sure if newspapers still exist, but uh, pr print version anyway. But let's say you suddenly wake up one day and you see a newspaper on your front uh, doorstep and it's been delivered accidentally. The person didn't know, maybe it was a new delivery boy. And you get the newspaper. Now that's an anomaly because it's never happened to you before. You've never had a newspaper. So you open up the newspaper, you might wanna look at the, the headline and maybe it's about war breaking out in the Middle East or something. And then you might ask yourself from a meaning standpoint, what's going on in my life that might reflect that? Is there some conflict going on? Am I going to war against somebody right now? And what is the underlying story of that uh, newspaper story? If you see what I'm getting at here, so the anomalies, so the, uh, in the Babylon, uh, Babylonian Omen series, for example, in the ancient Mesopotamian tradition, 
they would look to uh, anomalies. They would look to see, for example, if if, if a, a, a deformed animal was born near the palace of the, the emperor or the, the king, uh, what was the nature of that uh, animal? Did it have two heads, five legs, whatever it is? Or if there was a comet that would come by. Comet is an anomaly. It's not a normal sort of thing to see. So again, the unusualness, the thing that Carl Jung emphasized was he felt that uh, synchronicities, classic synchronicities were rare events, relatively rare events. They weren't just any old coincidence. They were synchronicities that had some kind of powerful impact like the one about the beetle of the, the scarab beetle where the, the, the client was, um, he was treating a patient and she had a dream about a scarab beetle and he hears a beetle in the window tapping. And it was the closest thing to a scarab beetle in, in Switzerland, I guess it was. And he goes and gets the beetle, he opens the window and he hands it to the woman and says, here's the beetle. That's not a normal event, but it, it the unusualness of it had uh, an import for her and for him. And the point that I would make just to elaborate a little bit on that is that where I may diverge a bit with Jung is that I don't see synchronicities as rare events in, in terms of when you understand the law of what they call the law of correspondences, the doctrine of correspondences of symbolic connections, this subterranean network of hidden resonances between events, you start to see coincidences of many different types. Uh, Emerson had a line to the effect, I can't quote it exactly, about the universe is interlaced with the web of um, secret analogies, something to that effect. And that when you understand the symbolic language of these uh, patterns, getting back to your term of patterns, you start to see connections, like you start to see how a person's life is connected to the stars in a way that may not be literally obvious. It's, if, you're, if you're thinking in terms of metaphor, you'll see it. Or for instance, like with Maggie, a scientist riding his bike across that river on the day that I did, would see the, the deer crossing the river and wouldn't make a connection in terms of a metaphoric connection. They wouldn't see, I'm talking about the average materialistic scientist, obviously. It, you have to think symbolically and metaphorically to see a deer crossing the river relating to Maggie passing over the river, so to speak, going over to the other side. So this symbolic mindset is critical to, I think, a broader vision of synchronicity and understanding how there are all of these different connections that you know, the, in a sense, the whole universe is coincidental in the sense that everything coincides in that sense. The, yes, thanks for that. Uh, the the um, terms I've been using and started off our discussion today with is mind mirrors. What do you think of that um, metaphor for what you just described, that the, what's around us mirrors our minds. Yeah, I think that's perfect, as without, so within. But again, it requires a symbolic way of thinking. For example, um, one of the other ways you tell, like what is a meaningful event according to tradition, traditional ideas, is what happens at the beginning of something. Uh, the omen idea that, that whatever happens around the beginning of something gives you the seeds of the outcome. So I know a woman that um, she got involved with a man, a relationship, and that I asked her what happened the first day that she met this man. And uh, she was a working as a clerk in a health food store. This is back in the early 80s. And she said that when she was first talking to this man, and being attracted to him, she said a car outside the store burst into flames. And the, the fire truck had to come and put the car out and all this. And <laughs> needless to say, that wasn't the most, you know, auspicious sort of uh, beginning for the relationship. And it turned out to be a, a nightmare relationship in some ways. And the as without, so within, you know, what happened outside in her life at that moment reflected, you know, something that was taking place within her and that was about to unfold. But again, a literal mindset wouldn't see that connection. What does a car bursting into flames have to do with a, a, an acrimonious relationship? 
it's it's symbol. Fire is you know a certain symbolic principle, and you know, the car bursting into flames had something to tell her. If you could see it symbolically, like a dream symbol, and that's gets back into the the premise of the waking dream, the notion that you really can look at your outer life in the same way you look at your dreams as having a symbolic import. So if you dreamt of a car bursting into flames, or for example, let's say you dreamt of a car crash, that makes it a little bit simpler, I think, two cars running into each other, you know, that would be a fairly simple thing to interpret as a dream symbol. It shows some kind of conflict taking place. And um, so if that happened in your outer life, you would ask yourself, okay, I saw that car crash out there. What was I thinking when I saw that? The outer reflects the outer mirrors to use your word, the inner. So I think that's a, a good way to look at it as without, so within. You're uh, making it clear to me that you have a passion for trying to, let me see, combat uh, materialistic linear thinking uh, with symbols, with symbolic thinking. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's Ray's Grassy's mission in life almost from what I'm hearing. In a way, I guess you could say that. It's, well, it, uh, it, it, when I look at patterns being repeated, this, you're saying the same idea uh, over and over again today. And you've said it in your other books too, that it's not uh, all linear and materialistic. We live in a symbolic, meaning-filled, meaningful, meaning-filled life. And it's all around us, Carl Jung. It's not just an anomalous experience. Those anomalous experiences tell us that maybe there are more of them, Carl, but not, not so rare. Right. And I remember there was some writer, I can't think of who it was. He, he talked about the curse of literalism ah. and the idea that you know, in, in the last few hundred years, society has moved towards a more literal way of looking at things. And there's a great line of uh, D.H. Lawrence about we no longer see the sun as having meaning and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And so I, I, in a recent podcast, uh, I talked about the difference between the way an astronomer looks at the stars and an astrologer is symbolism. You know, uh, astrology is simply astronomy interpreted symbolically. And so an astronomer might look at the planet Jupiter or the planet Mars or the planet Venus an astronomer would see those just in terms of material properties, but an astrologer or a symbolist or an occultist would look at those bodies in terms of what do they mean. And an, an occultist, a symbolist, a mystic would look at all events that way, that events of all sorts, you can look beyond the literal side into a deeper meaning of it. And you could do that with the fractal. You can talk about the fractal, excuse me, in terms of just as a mathematical geometrical principle or you can talk about it as a symbol that might have meaning in terms of what we're talking about here, in terms of our life, in terms of how a person's life is a fractal of the universe, in terms of the patterns in your small life reflect the patterns in the whole cosmos. Boy, you are really into this way of thinking, Ray. And uh, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> Guilty just, <as> charged. <laughs> it just exudes out of you. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, as above, so below, do? internet. What are you going to do? You're going to do what you're going to do. That's what you're doing. I mean, that's what you're. That's what I'm going to say. No put this. Pardon? There's no stopping me. Yeah, I'm going to. I was going to say that. Yeah, that, that you're stuck with. You're stuck with it. <laughs> that's yes. you. Uh, and I think it's wonderful. I think you've you've got um, a bell you're ringing and trying to say, "Hey, we live in a symbolic universe." Yeah. Yeah, and I think that synchronicities, the classic rare coincidence, gives us a kind of an opening to kind of look into that view. And I think Carl Jung realized that, but he knew he was somewhat constrained. He was trying to, Carl Jung had a foot in two different worlds. He had a foot in the scientific medical world, and then he had a foot in the mystical world. And he was trying to bridge those two. And it was a very dangerous sort of position for him to be in because he was considered very fringe. To this day, you can open up a psychology textbook and see nothing about Carl Jung because he was considered so far out there. And yet, you know, he clearly, if you really read between the lines and sometimes he said it explicitly, especially towards the end of his life, he had this symbolic mindset. Um, 
like what was the story you might remember this about the watch the watch had stopped and he took that as meaning something and yeah uh you know it's he thought in these terms but he had to he had to put it in a very limited fashion so that people wouldn't think he had totally gone off deep end with this and uh so the synchronicity the synchronistic event it's kind of like peering the curtain away a little bit to see this mechanism this clockwork symbolic mechanism of the universe and and he studied astrology liz green uh has written a couple of brilliant books about uh, carl jung's interest in astrology which if you really go into it is obvious he had a deep fascination with it and studied it but he had to keep that somewhat under wraps and the same thing i think with the whole sim symbolic mindset the symbolic worldview that he held um he couldn't really divulge how fully he went into that, but he gave us a form in which we could approach it and for more materialistic people to begin to understand it. One, what I think that uh, Scarab Beetle story is, is not just Carl Jung finding a beetle in uh, Zurich. Uh, and there were a lot of Rose Schaefer's they're called in Zurich in the spring. So it might not have been such a rare thing. And he might have known that it could have been a beetle on his tapping on his window when he went to get it because they're flying around all the time if it was spring and probably was. He picked it up and gave it to, took, took this beetle and gave it to this woman who was stuck in a, in a cauldron of uh, rationality. And he was trying to break her out of it. Yeah. And as you, as you described, he said, here is your scarab. And what Jung was doing there symbolically, and I, had, I believe that he knew it, was that he was giving the Western world a break from the cauldron, uh, from, the, from the constraints of rationality and materialism. This, this was a metaphor for what he was trying to do with Western thinking. It's become and still is the most famous of his uh, of his synchronicities, of his meaningful coincidences, and that's where I think he was trying to get. Maybe subconsciously he didn't realize it, but subconsciously was using that that photograph, that image of here is your beetle, to Western minds to start thinking symbolically. I think that's a great way to put it. You know, I think that. Um... And he talked about synchronicities as eruptions of meaning. They break through the kind of that literal mindset. And so when they do happen, they're so dramatic that I'll give you another example of this. And I might have uh, mentioned this to you before, but uh, I was overseas once and I, I met a couple of um, uh, German medical students. I was on a hike and uh, I was talking to the one fellow named uh, Rainier. And I, he was asking me about, uh, we were talking about what each, each of us was doing. And I mentioned I had started work on this book, The Waking Dream. And I said it was about synchronicities and coincidence and symbolism. And he, he didn't believe any of that. And he was very skeptical. And he said, but you know, something did happen to me once that I, I can't understand. And he talked about the time that a friend of his in Germany suddenly invited him to go with him on a trip to Los Angeles across the ocean to Los Angeles. This guy's, his friend's uh, girlfriend had dumped him or something and he had this extra ticket and he didn't wanna go by himself to, to Los Angeles. So he asked Rainier if he wanted to come with. He said, sure, on a moment's notice. They go to Los Angeles and uh, Rainier is staying at this house in Los Angeles by himself. His friend had gone off somewhere and he's there at the house alone and he hears a, uh, the doorbell ring and he goes to the door and he opens the door and there is a very close friend of his from back in Germany standing there and they look at each other their jaws drop they can't believe what they're seeing and they both say what are you doing here and it turns out this friend of Rainier's also had unexpectedly had an opportunity to go to Los Angeles was driving around got lost and decided to go up at random to a house and ring the doorbell and get directions and there was Rainier. Now, the reason I bring that up is because that was an eruption into Rainier's very materialistic Western mindset of meaning. 
that was the one thing that hit him so hard that he questioned, what is this all about? And for that woman in Jung's office, that beetle, here is your beetle, here is your scarab, that kind of broke through her resistance. And I think what you were saying, I think is a really good point. In a sense, Carl Jung was handing that beetle to Western, the Western mindset that this might break through this sort of event breaks through that sort of rigid mindset and uh, an eruption of archetype, an eruption of symbolism into our otherwise kind of prosaic literal mindset. Yes, um, uh, eruptions of meaning. Um, and, and by the way, I wanted to mention that uh, that that timepiece uh, coincidence that you referred to with Jung. Uh, Jung had so that our audience knows that a little bit. It's I have that in my uh, forthcoming book, that story, uh, because Jung had and was talking to a guy named Fierce, and Fierce wanted to know whether this book should be published or not by somebody who had uh, recently died, and um, Jung said no. And then uh, Jung looked at his watch, which had just came back from the watchmaker has supposedly been fixed and the wa they were supposed to meet at fierce at five o'clock was only five after five but Jung could tell it had gone on longer than that and so Jung asked fierce what is the time it? and it was 5 30 so Jung saw the watch was wrong so he then thought maybe that was a mirror of his mind that he was wrong so he said yeah maybe the book should be yes the book should be published and that's that's uh, that was that story, and that's how Jung was looking around. He 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 admitted to uh, in various places that he's looking for symbols all around him. If you look for that in some of his writings, yeah. but, but the story about Rainier, yeah, you told me this one before, and I really liked that story. It was a long time ago, uh, with Rainier and his friend. And what I'm doing is trying to come up with scientific ways of thinking about these things that are not within the realm of current science. And I too, like Jung, am a psychiatrist. Like Jung, I'm on the interface between uh, the, the symbolic and the materialistic. And I'm trying to make a bridge between the two of them as well. I'm a Pisces, so I, I, I do connections between things and I, <laughs> I get lost in them, of course, as you might guess, poor Pisces, and I feel sorry for us, and then we just get lost in things, but we need concrete things to hang on to, and this bridging thing between the, the material and uh, the symbolic is something that I'm doing so that I have an explanation, a partial explanation. None of my explanations for like weird stuff are fully within anything that looks like Western science, because there's a mystery involved to all of them. And that mystery has something to do with what Ray Grassi is trying to teach us, is that there, it, it's a mirror around us. The stuff that happens around us has something to do with us. And if we look symbolically, we can get messages from those areas about what we are doing, as I did this morning in reading my book, and coming up with uh, the fractal thing as I was thinking about it, the Fibonacci sequence. And when we're talking here, Ray, you get a call about the fractals and Fibonacci and your book cover. I mean, what better example, ladies and gentlemen, can we have of mirrors between two people's minds? Yeah. And, you know, in terms of trying to make sense of these events, uh, as an astrologer, I look to how the stars and the planets are activating when these dramatic events happen. If I had been able to get Rainier's birth information, for example, I'm sure that if I had looked to back when that event happened in Los Angeles, I'd see a certain convergence of events in my own life. Time and again, whenever I've had dramatic synchronicities or symbolic events or just dramatic events, period, you can look at the horoscope and you will see dramatic patterns in the horoscope certain, like for, for me, it tends to be Jupiter Uranus uh, uh, patterns or certain alignments. You'll see patterns, you know, when the stars align, this notion of, you know, the stars align in a person's chart in a way that tend to be very dramatic as far as manifesting externally as, as powerful events. Um, I had an event happen a number of years ago, and I don't know if I've told you this one, 
where a friend of mine uh, lived on the south side of Chicago and he asked me to give uh, a talk about Egypt. I had been involved with some research in Egypt back in the 90s. And he asked me to give a talk to his study group. And I took the train down to the south side of Chicago. And I had some photographs that I had taken in Egypt, some high quality prints that I had in an envelope that I brought with me to show the group. And I gave this talk, and as usual, what happens in these talks, uh, people tend to ask about the curse of Tut's tomb and all this. And there were some unusual things that happened around uh, people dying mysteriously. In particular, there was a man named, uh, named Richard Bethel. He was Howard Carter, Car Howard Carter, 100 years ago this year, in fact, uh, was the discoverer of King Tut's tomb. And uh, Richard Bethel was his personal secretary, and Richard Bethel was one of the people that died, uh, supposedly of, uh, in his sleep as being suffocated, asphyxiation, a pillow over his face, maybe something like that. And then his father, Lord Westbury, uh, died falling out of a fifth floor window, I guess it was, in England. So there were some interesting deaths that happened uh, around Tut's tomb. I don't know whether they were really mysterious or not, but that's not the point. I gave that talk and I came home, I took the train home, I got back to the Western suburbs out here. And I realized I had left the envelope full of photographs on the train that had fallen alongside the seat. And I thought, oh, these were expensive photographs. And I called up the next morning the uh, train station to Lost and Found. And I said, did by any chance did these photographs turn up when they cleaned the train at night? And the guy said, uh, who answered the phone, he says, yes, we have them here. Why don't you come down? So I took the train down there. And I went to the lost and found office in the train station in, in Chicago. And he had me back, he hands me back the envelope with the photographs. And he says, I, look at, I took a look at these photographs. It's really interesting. Uh, you know, I, I have a family connection to, you know, over, over there in Egypt, uh, England and Egypt. And I looked down on his badge and his name was Bethel. And it turns out to make a long story short that he was related to the two people I talked about in the uh, lecture uh, that had died mysteriously around uh, you know, the Tut tomb. And it wouldn't have happened, and this is I think an important part of it, it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have forgotten the, that envelope on the train. You think you're doing something that's a mistake or an accident and it leads to something else, you know. And, uh, and again, I looked to going back to the astrological side of it, I looked to the horoscope at that time and I had this powerful set of energies happening in that time. And it was connected to other things that were going on for me. It wasn't, it was like a microcosm of other things that were happening to me, not only around Egypt, but around some other research I was doing. So it's, uh, that was, that's, that was pretty dramatic that, for me. That, that was, that's a good one, Ray. That is a good one. Um, the, how, it's, I, I lost, I got lost, my dog got lost, I got lost, and we found each other. So there's, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, a wonder in being lost, uh, that things can happen uh, in that. I call it tearing the web of quotidian reality, is a simple way of saying it. When you tear that web, then you get these coincidences flying through sometimes. Yeah. You have to be aware of them. Uh, you have to be thinking this way. And you have to also keep grounded because I'm a psychiatrist and I hear people getting so caught up in seeing a lot of these things. They get overly symbolic and they start looking for meaning and can't find it because they kind of know it's there and they may be right but it's so many of them and so complex for them and so multi-layered that they can't really do it and it makes them uh, anxious or more. You know, this is, um, this can, like anything, it can go to extremes. Yeah. And so there's a, a great movie, I can't think of the name, Jeff Who Lives at Home with His Mother or something like that. You might know the film. <laughs> no. And uh, if look up Jeff Who Lives in the Mother's Basement, whatever it is. And it's about someone that goes to extremes, kind of looking at meaning and everything. And anything can be taken to extremes. You can meditate too much. You can, you know, get too much into your music. You can, you know, go too far with any given field. And that's true for synchronicity. You can start looking for 
meanings and everything. And so this is this has to be reined in like anything else does. Uh, How do you, you know, recommend people rein it in? Well, having a life is a good start. It's not a bad thing to do. You know, <laughs> if, if a person, it's one of the dangers of being, I think, a writer or a researcher in any field, you can get so heavily into it that you see everything through that prism. And having having a family, having a job, having responsibilities, I think is a way to kind of rein you in. If, if you had the luxury, like some uh, researchers do, of just doing nothing but that research, I think you can start to see everything, you know, through that sort of uh, that lens. Good, very good. And, and one of the other things that people need, I think, is some foundational explanation for some of these. And it's whether it's right or not, this explanation, it's also a grounder. Uh, it's something go, they can go to. And for you, astrology is, is your go-to explainer or go-to way of understanding or go-to parallel. I don't know if you want to use the word explaining because you want to talk about how the symbols interact with each other as above, so below. But this, this, this works for you as a grounder. And what I'm trying to do is, is invent um, ideas that can be partially grounding, like Rainier friend coming to his door i have i call that human gps where you find your way to where you need to be without knowing how you get there okay. and it's it's a variation on psi um, uh, it's a psi mediated instrumental response is the research name for being able to do such things so i try to bring what might be explanations that are only partial for example what you talk about is uh, uh, rare events <clears throat> as starters. Well, they could be called low probability events. So I have to deal with st statisticians who say the universe is all random. And I say, all these coincidences do have a probability of happening. There is, but you can't measure it very well, but it kind of a sense for it, what is the low probability event. And that becomes a characteristic of the coincidence. And the lower the probability, the more unusual it is, then the more attention it deserves, which is using some of the same ideas you have, but putting in somewhat different terms. I think tied to that is, uh, and you uh, getting back to the point about grounding, I think that anytime you get into any sort of esoteric, metaphysical, occult area, you have to have a pretty well-developed set of uh, critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where I think it is good to be grounded in conventional science or research or statistics. So one of the things I find valuable about astrology is that it is predictable and that you can make predictions and see if they come true or not. It's not just after the fact 2020 hindsight. So for instance, I'll use a, a specific example where um, uh, a few years ago, I wrote an article about this major thing happening in, in, for the United States right now, Pluto return. Uh, Pluto's coming back around to the point where it was in 1776 for the first time in US history. And I made a series of predictions about what might happen in 2022 right now. And a lot of those things are coming true. And so there is an element of critical thinking involved with symbolist thinking and astrological thinking where you can actually test things out. It's testable. And you can make predictions and if they don't come true, you recalibrate, you go back and you say, okay, that doesn't work. Where did I go wrong? It's not just this sort of nebulous, airy fairy idea of whatever goes. Uh, so critical thinking, I think, is, is, is well, critical in, the, in this regard. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, as we get to, toward the end of our conversation, uh, I, I'd like to mention to you the Coincidence Project. And the Coincidence Project, the intent of it is, as I've mentioned before, to illuminate the hidden currents that connect and unite us. And its basic intent is to encourage people as we are doing to tell each other coincidence stories so they can see what those connections are because we need to be able to highlight them and as the emerson quote you mentioned we are in a web 
we exist in a web of meaning that can be elucidated and illuminated through coincidences as well as other ways. The intent of the coincidence project in its, in its uh, grandeur, perhaps, or in its grandest idea, but it's very practical, is to help people recognize that we are all one. Yes, we, by all one, I mean we are part of a collective human organism. And this collective human organism has each of us as a cell in that organism looking to find what our particular talent is that we can contribute to getting this addicted being that we are to stop chewing up this planet and keep and get away from the addiction to more and more material things and go for our go for what we're looking for which is a, an expanded more spiritual more psychologically loving uh, way of interacting with each other that's what our greed is intended to be able to get to so in doing that I, i'm recognizing that the cho as i call it has to pay attention to a lot of information and what is, what is it, can astrology tell us about an idea like this to try to do something to help inha inhibit the collective human organism from destroying its habitat and turning what we have here into a playground of fun and learning? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. Um... Well, I think you and I would agree that one of the points of synchronicity, you talk about the mirroring effect, the mind is connected to the world. And I think intention is a big part of this. And that, uh, you know, I'm not sure what any one individual can do, but I'm absolutely convinced of the, the power of many minds together coordinated. And uh, like the, what, what do you, you probably remember this better than I do, the, um, random number generators that yeah. project around the world and how yeah. you know certain events seem to bring together minds in a way that imagine if you could marshal that imagine if everybody like when i was a kid and we looked at uh, neil armstrong stepping on the moon and now imagine that's how many millions of people uh, focused on one thing at the same time imagine if we could find a way of focusing that many minds on a certain intention uh, what would happen as a result of, well, I think it would manifest in synchronistic ways too, in terms of, you'd see that manifesting as far as world events in terms of events in our own lives. Uh, so this, this sense that astrology and synchronicity, I think, share the idea that the world is made of mind stuff. And if you really take that seriously, that has profound implications in terms of how we can affect the world, how we can shape our futures, not only as individuals, but as a civilization. And that's, that's just what I'm thinking about with this collective human organism. We got to collect us and do it consciously rather than just react to Princess Diana getting, getting killed. Uh, we got to react to or some other event. We have to do it intentionally. We have to collect our intentions together to be able to think of an outcome how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Well, it only <laughs> takes one, but that light bulb better want to change. Want to change. <laughs> and that, that's the whole, and the, this collective human organism has to start thinking about being able to change. And I, I particularly appreciate your mentioning indirectly the Global Consciousness Project out of Princeton University, because I have a lead to have one of the researchers there uh, to possibly be a guest on my show. And I've been trying to think about what we would talk about. You've just made it clear to me. Thank you for what we would talk about. So here's another, as we end, there's another Ray Bernie connection here. And I, I want to tell you that I've really enjoyed talking with you you have a nice vibe around you ray and it's easy for me to be able to feel uh, a connection with you and how you're thinking and i very much respect how you're thinking about all of this and i appreciate your being with me today well i enjoyed it a great deal thank you you're welcome and as we as we end uh please tell us something about ray grassy personally about you as a person rather than you as a great thinker um, you know, I, uh, I spend most of my time writing, especially with the COVID. 
And uh, I'm coming out of a, an interesting period. I, I, I had a couple different cancers. And so I, I've been recovering from cancer this last year or so. It's been a very challenging year, but I really feel like I'm back on track. And, uh, and one of the advantages of the COVID combined with being bedridden for the last year or so has been I've been doing a lot of writing. So I have a new book coming out this year. Next, this year. And um, you know, it's been challenging, but you know, it's, it's been good in a lot of ways. It's um, uh, not sure what else to tell you. It's, uh, you know, it's been challenging for everybody I know this last year. And, uh, you know, I just try to take the, take advantage of it in what ways I can. It's not always easy, but uh, that's probably, that's what comes to mind. I'm sure I could think of more if I thought about it, but that it's, comes to it's mind. It's very good because you leave us with a, Another important idea is to try to turn stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Yeah. And you have been trying to do that and you're producing a book. Uh, and it was great feeling your energy, which feels pretty good to me. Uh, so it looks like a good recovery from my experience of you. So keep it going, Ray. Keep it going. Thank you. You're welcome. This Atmosphere is a mental atmosphere, like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.